Hello and welcome to the SAIS Immunopedia COVID-19 webinar series that is sponsored by Indaba Biotech. I am Sabel Jalo and I shall be the moderator for today's webinar, which shall have two talks. Please use the Q&A panel to ask questions, to share your experiences and even challenges at any time during the webinar. Our first speaker is Professor Clive Gray. Clive is a professor of immunology at the University of Cape Town and chair of the Division of Immunology. He obtained his PhD at WITS in 1994 and then spent three years as a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for AIDS Research at Stanford University in the US. Subsequently, he worked at the NITD for 12 years where he spearheaded an HIV immunology group and worked on HIV pathogenesis and vaccines. Since then, he has focused on pediatric immunity in HIV exposed on infected children and recently initiated a reproductive immunology group looking at placental immunity to infections. Clive is the director of the Immunopedia Foundation, which provides global ed immunology education through the online website. Clive is a highly accomplished scientist who has published widely on HIV immunology, has six active NIH grants, and has supervised over 40 students at all levels, including PhD and postdoctoral levels. His talk today will focus on immune responses during COVID-19 infection. Over to you, Clive. So thank you very much, Sibel. Um, I shall share my screen now. Uh, so good day, everybody. Um, I hope everybody is well today. So I, I'm a, a, a unashamed, unashamedly a cellular immunologist, and I'm going to talk to you in a very idiosyncratic way about my views on the possible immune responses that cause severe COVID-19 in some, and uh, what could be the, the immune responses that, uh, that, that, are, that are those in those who recover from COVID-19. So my outline is, what do we know from the original SARS epidemic uh, way back 17 years ago in 2003? And I think there we can begin to learn um, what some of the pathogenic signals are and what some of the protective signals might be. And I'm going to uh, merge that between uh, what I think and what I view as the balance between inflammation and tolerance. And I'll explain what I mean by tolerance when we get to the point. Uh, and then what happens to people who progress uh, to severe COVID-19 and what might be happening in those that uh, in, in infected people who remain asymptomatic or who have few symptoms and or who have COVID-19 and recover. So if we look at the uh, spectrum of respiratory infections ranging from rhinovirus, adenovirus, RSV, uh, pandemic influenza, but of course SARS and MERS were the, uh, I would say original coronaviruses that, that caused um, great mortality in those who were infected and great respiratory infections. And in fact, those uh, who were infected with SARS, the original SARS, probably had a 40% rate of ICU attendance. So it was much more virulent than the current SARS-CoV-2. But it's, 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 it's interesting to note that the common symptoms are uh, fever, chills, cough, shortness of breath, dyspepsia, myalgia, and the clinical symptoms of uh, acute respiratory syndrome distress, syndrome respiratory failure and fibrosis. So there's very great parallels. And if we look at the work that was done trying to understand the pathogenic signals versus the protective signals, if we look on the left side here, the pathogenic or dysregulated uh, immunity that, gi that gives rise to inflammation, the causes and I think a very key here is that there's a large viral inoculum or a large early viral load. There is a delayed immune response, a delayed gamma interferon response, uh, and a very, very hyper-inflammatory response of monocyte and macrophages and a neutrophil inflammation, a neutrophil infl infiltration into the lung tissue. So very great parallels with SARS-CoV-2. And the consequences 
are enhanced epithelial and endothelial cell apoptosis, increased vascular leakage, and really very poor T cell and antibody responses. And of course, the outcome uh, leading to, to uh, acute respiratory dist distress syndrome and of course death. Much higher mortality in the original SARS than in, in the SARS COVID 2 outbreak. So, if we look at the protective side, which is on the right side, we find that um, there, there's a, a much lower viral inoculum, a much lower viral replication in the individuals, a much earlier immune response, a, a interferon response. Uh, you have an inflammatory response, but it's a lower, it's a lower monocyte macrophage and neutrophil infiltration and a lower pro-inflammatory cytokine response. You have minimal epithelial and endothelial cell apoptosis and a much more robust T cell response, which in those very early publications from those years ago, it was a very focused T cell response on the, on the spike protein, which would use the ACE2 receptor for entry into the host and the host would then survive. So if we view the immune system as a balance, as an equilibrium between inflammation and tolerance. So when there's inflammation, uh, if there's an outweighing of tolerance and the hyperinflammation, as we see with SARS-CoV-2, you have a certain level of patho pathology and you have this inflammatory disease causing reactions against self, autoimmunity, vascular leakage, and so on. And in the end, organ failure. Now, I'm going to talk to you very briefly about a phenomenon called tissue tolerance. And this is where SARS will infect uh, various tissues and various organs, those that express ACE2 receptors, but there's no overt inflammation that goes hand in hand with the pathogen itself. It is the inflammatory response, and we call that tissue tolerance. So there's this balance between tolerance and inflammation. This is a, 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 an original publication uh, from over 10 years ago showing the overexpression of CXCL10 or IP10 in the lung tissue from autopsy specimens of those individuals that have died from COVID-19. And on the, on the right side, you see a controlled autopsy lung. So this was a, a very good indication in the, in the original SARS outbreak that you could have infiltrating cells, infiltrating leukocytes and lymphocytes into the lung tissue. So a recent publication that came out uh, about two or three months ago, it still has, it's in a pre-publication um, forum, and that is explaining tissue tolerance to SARS-CoV-2. And what they are explaining here is what you see in green is the presence of SARS-CoV-2, and you can see it's extensively present in many, many tissues. And this was done on post-mortem sampling from individuals that had died from COVID-19. When they looked at the inflammatory signals uh, in those cells, and along with the, uh, the proteins, the S, the spike protein that belonged to SARS-CoV-2, what they found was that the inflammation was primarily localized to the lung tissue and was not localized itself to the organ. And they were promoting uh, this, this particular theory of tissue tolerance that, that, that it's the virus, that it's not the virus that's causing inflammation, it's the immune response to the virus that is causing the, the pathology and the associated cell death. So if you look here on the right, this is, these are, are tissue sections from the lung, uh, and this is showing a representation. This, this in the red here is S protein, and these are epithelial cells. And you can see that the, the, the virus um, has entered into the epithelial cell through the H2 receptors. These are endothelial cells where there's very little uh, uh, um, infection of the endothelial cells and virtually no infection of the macro macrophages themselves. And so what we think is, and what we can piece together a picture of what's happening is that you have this infiltration of macrophages, proliferation of inflammatory macrophages and monocytes, infiltration of neutrophils, causing this incredible damage within the lung tissue. And um, this hyperinflammation, the systemic hyperinflammation then has a knock-on effect to every single organ uh, throughout the body causing mayhem and chaos.
So if we look at the data showing increased inflammatory cytokines, uh, this came out a few months ago from a group uh, in, in the US, where this was uh, looking at healthy, mild to moderate individuals with COVID-19 and those who were in ICU and in a, in a critical stage. And it's certainly IL-1 beta is a very clear signal. IL-6 is an extremely strong clear signal along with interleukin-8 and CCL5. Now, of course, these are chemokines uh, that are involved in the infiltration of cells into the lung tissue. And in fact, when they use lironolimab, which is a CCR5 blocker, um, they had a reduced plasma IL-6 in these patients. And uh, in fact, a decreased SARS COVID signal, a C increased viral signal uh, in, in the plasma. So the hypothesis here was that if you block CCR5, you can inhibit the migration of an inflammatory inducing cells uh, such as monocytes and macrophages to the lung. So the cartoon events here showing the alveolar tissue is that you have infiltrating neutrophils, um, activated macrophages, uh, you have the SARS-CoV-2 uh, infecting the epithelial cells, and this infiltration into the lung alveola is what is causing the cytokine storm within the tissue itself and the uh, destruction of the tissue due to that. So if you can block uh, the migration, and here they're proposing that CXCL2 or C sorry, CXCR2 blockers would be very instrumental in blocking this. But it also gives an idea that uh, such a drug like dexamethasone, which is, we know that if it gets, gets given at the very end stage, we have this incredible hyperinflammation, dampens almost like the downstream effects of this hyperinflammation, whereas the uh, chemokine inhibitors uh, are blocking the infiltration and, and a bit more upstream. So what is causing this inflammation? So is it the virus itself? Well, it probably isn't, but what it probably is happening, and this was a, 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 a beautiful publication that came out looking at systems immunology uh, last month, showing, and it, this was showing um, in healthy, moderate, severe, and in patients uh, going into ICU in blue. So red and blue, take note of the red and blue in these graphs. So this is interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor, and MCP3, which are uh, inflammatory cytokines that were measured in the plasma. And when they looked at uh, three particular inflammatory uh, cytokines that were indicative of pulmonary damage, so ONRAGE is a biomarker of pulmonary damage, TNF SF114 is highly expressed in human fibroblasts and be released when there is damage. And OSM is a regulator for interleukin-6 production. And what they found is that uh, the cells, plasma, plasma cytoid dendritic cells and myeloid cells within the circulation were not the producers of these, uh, these pro-inflammatory cytokines. And actually, it was the tissue origin, it was the damage in the lung that was causing the uh, release of these uh, inflammatory mediators that was causing uh, inflammation in the host. What is causing that? Well, they propose that it's the microbial products with the microbiome in the lung, where you have this incredible damage in the lung and release of microbial products from the lung parenchyma into the circulation. So when they looked at the uh, bacterial 16S RNA gene presence, they found that it was significantly higher in those with severe or those in ICU uh, compared to healthy controls. And also lipopolysaccharide, which is a gram-negative bacterial product, was highly circulating in the plasma of COVID-19 patients in ICU. And when they correlated the plasma cytokine levels with the bacterial DNA copies, they found that there was significant correlations between those in, with severe and ICU with uh, the presence of the bacterial DNA and, 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 the, and, and, and the plasma cytokines, leading to the conclusion that it's um, uh, lung damage and microbial transplication are probably the likely cause of the hyperinflammation in severe COVID-19. 
So that gives a little bit of a snapshot of what we know, and, and I think this has been talked about a lot uh, in the scientific literature and, and in the media about what causes the hyperinflammation and the damage to those that go on to uh, severe COVID-19 and unfortunately uh, surmise. But if we look at the data, and this is from the John Hopkins app uh, on my cell phone that I downloaded this morning, uh, and that is whether we take this data or not take it, it's data. And 89.02% of individuals in South Africa appear to recover. If you compare that to the global recovery, 72.6 or 72.7% of, of individuals worldwide appear to recover. In South Africa, the mortality rate is about 261 people per million or 2.38% mortality compared is slightly lower than the world average of 3.1. Of course, different countries throughout the globe have um, varying spectrums of mortality. But we also can't ignore the fact that in Africa and South Africa being probably the highest mortality rate with, with throughout the continent, uh, the mortality rate appears to be low. So why is that and why do people recover? So in terms of uh, my perspective as, a, as an immunologist, immune memory is essential. And that is essential to preserving self. So if memory is disengaged or short-lived, whether it be a B cell memory for antibody production, or what I'm going to talk about is T cell memory for long-lived circulating memory T cells that could provide long-lived protection, um, it is essential that this is preserved. So here I'm showing a generic picture of the magnitude of response versus antigen exposure, the first antigen exposure, which is the, your peak of vir viremia. And then you have the magnitude of, of immune response, and that could be an immune cell. In this case, I'm talking about adaptive immunity. Uh, we'll, we do know that there is trained immunity as well in terms of the innate arm. But in terms of adaptive immunity, here you have the initial response, which then contracts. And then upon second exposure of antigen, it could be a reinfection or a resurgence of a prior infection, you have a recall response, which provides some level of protection. Now, when this memory is dysregulated or it becomes dysfunctional, that is when uh, protective immunity becomes uh, um, a, a questionable uh, entity in itself and, and maybe just dysregulated. What we don't know about SARS-CoV-2 is how long this memory lasts for, if there is memory for that matter, and whether whatever the cells that are being detected can provide protection. So the unknown in many ways is that we know that there are tissue resident CD8 positive cells in the lung and the question is, can these resident cells provide any level of protective immunity? Where we know from many, many acute viral infections that are self-resolving, that is, it is the CD8 T cell response that provides this level of T cell immune protection. So that is what we don't know. So let's look at some things that are now emerging and what we might be, that might be getting to know and, and beginning to appreciate. So the first emerging knowledge that we have is that there might be a level of pre-existing T-cell immunity. Now, there's a precedent for this. The outbreak 10 years ago or thereabouts of the H1N1 flu, uh, there were investigations showing that pre-existing T-cell immunity existed to H1N1. And in fact, the presence of cross-reactive T-cells was found to correlate with less severe disease. Uh, there's evidence to show that there's cross-reactivity in the original SARS outbreak and MERS outbreak with uh, bat coronavirus um, proteins and epitopes. Um, coming into the era of SARS-CoV-2 uh, from a Swedish study, they found that in 20%, 28% of unexposed healthy blood donors, there was cross-reactive T cell responses against the spike or membrane protein. Um, recently in July, there were, uh, from Grafoni, uh, uh, Alex 
uh, um, Alexandra's group showed that substantial cross-reactive SARS-CoV-2 CD4 and CD8 T cells were observed and that the long-lasting T cell memory from the original outbreak could cross-react with the SARS-CoV-2 nuclear, nuclear capsid protein. Um, and also that the SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells in individuals with no history of SARS or COVID-2 uh, um, uh, or had contact, no one who had contact with SARS or COVID-2 um, were able to cross-react and, and uh, react with SARS-CoV-2 peptides. So there is a level of mounting evidence showing that there is some level of cross-reactivity. So here is the data from Labert's um, study that appeared in Nature um, uh, last month or so. And if you look at the unexposed individuals here, so half of the unexposed individuals had no response whatsoever to any of the uh, proteins found in SARS-CoV-2. But what was evident is that there was reactivity and mostly in the, in the, in the non-structural proteins, but also in the nuclear capsid as well as the nuclear non-structural proteins in the nuclear capsid. And this is the mark. So this was found in 50% of unexposed individuals who had had no contact whatsoever with people with SARS or COVID. Compare that to those with COVID-19. You can see that the immunodominant response here in light blue um, is to the, uh, nuclear, it's the nuclear capsid protein only with uh, some level of responses as well to the uh, non-structural proteins. And if you take those who are infected but don't have uh, a disease, in other words, they are, uh, for all intents and purposes, um, very mild symptoms, um, there's a very strong response uh, to the nuclear capsid protein. So the immunodominant response is therefore not to spike. Uh, it is to the uh, non-structural protein. And then if we look at the Crofoni uh, uh, papers data, uh, uh, what, what they're showing here is that about 50% of the CD4 responses, so black is the unexposed, so 50% of these individuals here had some kind of response uh, to the T cell, which is a more of a functional response of measuring um, uh, CD137, which gets upregulated. Uh, upon exposure to antigen along with OX40 uh, expression. So 50% of unexposed individuals show these CD4 responses where all the exposed individuals have a response of some kind. So this is taken from the graphical abstract in the paper that appeared in Cell, uh, which is perhaps a little bit easier to digest. And that is a those with COVID-19 100% of CD4 responses uh, res uh, recognize either spike, membrane, nuclear capsid, or the non-structural proteins here. And 70% of the CD8 cells did the same. And they used a series of overlapping peptides uh, corresponding to the sequence of the SARS-CoV-2. But I think interestingly, and maybe here are the clues as to cross-protective, maybe, T cell responses is that 50% of CD4 T cells, as I showed in the previous slide, uh, certainly could be mapped to responses to spike non structural proteins and to membrane proteins. And 20% of the CD8 responses, albeit much weaker in the unexposed, but they were there, again, were to these overlapping peptide regions. So emerging two, and this, this came out last week from uh, the Oxford group showing that um, there was a, a broadly reactive memory. I pointed out and I mentioned earlier that memory was all important. What type of memory is important? And they found, and here they were looking at, uh, uh, these are pentamer specific, so these are uh, epitope specific CD8 cells belonging to certain uh, MHC class one. So these are MHC class one restricted CD8 T cell responses. And one of the questions that they wanted to ask was what type of memory response are these cells? And what they found is that individuals with mild to moderate 
uh, COVID-19 who recovered um, had a, a memory differentiation phenotype belonging to these um, COVID specific uh, 19 specific cells of an early differentiated or central memory, which is pretty good in terms of being able to respond again in terms of a, a recall memory response. But interestingly, what they found is that those with severe COVID-19, they had a, a large overall T cell response uh, to COVID-19, but a, a, a much higher CD8 specific T cell response existed in those with mild COVID-19. So in other words, there appeared to be some level of CD8 reactivity in mild individuals uh, that could possibly be protected. We don't know the answers to that. And in fact, um, um, let me just go into this slide because this, this uh, was a editorial in Nature um, also um, highlighting this particular paper. And I think this is interesting to note that in, if you look down here in severe COVID-19, there was overall a very large T cell response uh, and a minimum, a, a relatively less CD8 T cell response. Whereas in mild COVID-19, there was a, a much higher CD8 and a more robust CD8 response. Could these be protective? What we don't know are the ones in red here. It's unknown kinetics and the hierarchy of this antiviral T cell response in that acute stage of viral infection. And then also at the other end of the spectrum, um, it's an unknown duration. How long do these memory cells last for? And does the hierarchy change? And is that important? In the Swedish study that I pointed out that 28% of unexposed individuals um, had some kind of uh, reactivity. Now here I'm showing that in the patients or the individuals that had mild COVID-2 uh, uh, infection, these individuals had um, a CD4 response, uh, which was both gamma interferon and tumor necrosis factor co-expression, but, but it was very uh, limited to, um, in terms of uh, potential to um, express other um, cytokines such as interleukin-2. However, uh, when they looked at CD8, they found that CD8s were much more multifunctional and actually recognized spike membrane nuclear capsin and could also express perforin and granzyme B. So these cells express the ingredients for potential protective immunity. The question is, are they protective or not? So the other unknown, which I'll finish off with now, is the evolution of SARS-CoV-2 in immunity. Now we know, um, and this came out uh, from Betty Corbett's group in Cell uh, a couple of months ago, showing that there's a global evolution and a global wave of, uh, um, in this case, there was a, a mutation uh, not not on a pro-virus basis, but in a population basis, uh, from a D614 to a G614 in the spike protein. And in this case, it plays into, potentially plays into greater infectivity, but also potentially uncovering an epitope that could be neutralized much better. But coming from the field of HIV, where we think that um, mutations are bad, and we think they are determined by possible immune pressure from the host. We don't know whether this particular evolution is stochastic or random, or is, is potentially determined by uh, the immune response that is, that is governed by the individual hosts that are infected. So in conclusions, in my idiosyncratic surmise of what we currently think we know, is the virus itself is unlikely to be pathogenic, and you have a level of tissue tolerance, and it is the hyperinflammation involving the chemokines and inflammatory innate and adaptive cells that migrate to these hot areas of damage, causing the lung and the heart and the GIT damage and the pathology. And the key to treatment is, of course, to dampen this inflammation, dexamethasone, is a good example, which is a sledgehammer approach, but one, one would be a more targeted approach to actually stop the migration of these inflammatory cells. 
And then the majority of infected people seem to recover. And is this due to some form of existing immunity? Now, I'm, I, I know that there are different theories and I'm only homing in on one theory and my theory that I would like to propose is that there is a level of T cell protective immunity. So those that do recover possess early and, and central differentiated memory CD8 cells that not only recognize spike, but more importantly, recognize non-spike proteins. And that's extremely important because that's a level of cross reactivity that may exist in those that might have a head start in, in, in having lower symptoms to infection. And can this provide protective immunity? And is this good news for vaccines? Well, that's a story that's going to unfold in front of us uh, in, in the months to come. So thank you very much and I'll take questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Clive. That was a great presentation. So now we'll go to the question and answers. Uh, the first question is by Garrett Kanthar, who has two questions. Um, the first is, if bacterial translocation causes severe COVID-19, could antibiotics be useful or protective? The second one is, could there be a quantiferon type test for T cell immunity to this type, to this virus to identify pre-existing or new immunity? I'll, I'll, I'll take the second one first because uh, um, the, um, the Swedish publication um, actually used the Ellisbot assay uh, to measure gamma, gamma interferon um, responses to identify responses both in the unexposed and the exposed. So I would say that's the first step towards a quantiferon type assay to, to look at that. So I would say that's probably quite feasible, yes. Um, the first question would be antibiotic use. So that's a very interesting point and I, I, I think we can only hazard a guess. <laughs> and I don't like to guess because we, we, we want to base us whatever we say on evidence, but um, Certainly, we know that antibiotics can disrupt uh, the microbiome. We know that very well from the, from the gut microbiome. Whether it does so in the, in the lung, I'm not sure. It's a good question, but I'm not sure what the answer is. Um, yeah, it could be that the others on the forum might know some better answers to that. Uh, another question is, there seems to be significant cases of severe um, or ICU COVID-19 that show similar immune responses to recovered or mildly ill patients. How sure can we be that this immune response is really the differential and that cytokine inhibitors, not sure of this term, will aid most um, patients then? Yeah, um, well, I, I think bottom line, we don't know, but I think it revolves around memory. And I think what we do know, certainly from, from chronic persistent uh, infections like HIV, for example, is that if you have chronic inflammation, you have T cell exhaustion and you have burnout, um, and you might have a state of energy or just those T cells get deleted uh, due to apoptosis. So it could be that the differentiation between those who recover and those who don't recover, where you might at a gross level see similarities, is in terms of the functional memory status. I would hazard a guess that in people who have severe COVID-19, that their memory and exhaustion status is somewhat curtailed, um, whereas those who recover it's, it's around memory and long-lived memory to that. Um, I, would, I, would, I would think that, that in terms of adaptive immunity, that may distinguish between the two. And of course, I, I'm not naive to think that that's not, it, there, are, there are multiple factors going on, going on here. There's also innate immunity, trained immunity, um, yeah, uh, that, that may play a very important role in, I think, facilitating the adaptive arm of the immune response. And any delay in that response is probably very bad news for, for the patient. Okay, and uh, the last question um, 
from uh, Kerrigan is, um, where is it? Sorry. How does the data you share support the hypothesis that severe disease occurs as a consequence of the size of the infected dose? So we don't have enough data to really support that hypothesis uh, yet, or refute it for that matter. It's, it's neither one way or the other. Um, I think until we can have a really good measure of understanding the size of the inoculum, uh, and then relating that to the size of the immune response, uh, we don't know the answer to that. I, I guess what we, what all we can know is the severity, uh, the clinical severity of, of symptoms. Um, but again, we can take our cues from other viral infections that if you have lower viral infectivity, you probably have a better chance of providing some level of immune protection. It's an extrapolation, it may be wrong, but, um, but yeah, we, we need to have accrue more evidence for sure. So um, thank you everyone, sorry, um, we can't, we'll take, um, Clive can answer the rest of the questions in the uh, Q&A. Yes, um, so we'll move on to the next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Melinda Shushai. Melinda obtained her medical degree from the University of ritz Bratisland in 2000, after which she obtained her master's of, her master's of medicine and specialization in clinical pathology. Melinda became the head of, for the Center for Vaccines and Immunology at the National Institute for Communicable Diseases in 2013, with a joint chemical pathology appointment at WITS. As head of the Center for Vaccines and Immunology, Melinda oversees the polio, measles, and rubella regional reference labs for the WHO. Melinda has been the president of the South African Immunology Society since 2018. She is also a member of the National Advisory Group on Immunization, the Immunology Expert Community, Committee of the NHLS, and the National Polio Expert Committee. Melinda's research interests are in immune tolerance with particular focus on infectious diseases such as HIV and tuberculosis. Melinda's talk will focus on macrophage activation and the nicotinamide pathways. Over to you, Melinda. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Sabelle. Um, and I'm going to take you on a slightly different uh, pathway now and um, hone in on the macrophage and in particular concentrate on nicotinamide and I'll explain why. Um, just a disclaimer is that the views expressed in this presentation are my own and do not reflect the views of uh, my employer or the SIS or any other institution. So as some background, uh, we know that SARS-CoV-2 infection can result in COVID-19 disease of varying severity. Um, it's been described as a biphasic illness. We know there are, there's infiltration of macrophages and T cells into the lungs. And the macrophage responses play a role in this hyperinflammatory syndrome or what's been termed a cytokine storm that accompanies severe disease. And in fact, some of the histopathology reports describe some features of uh, macrophage activation syndrome when they looked out a microscope and look at lungs of people who have died of COVID. We know that there are risk factors, including age, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, male gender, uh, and various others. But these are the ones that I uh, draw your attention to for the purpose of this talk. And um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a background on nicotinamide. What is it? So most of us will uh, know of nicotinamide as vitamin B3, which we can uh, eat through our diet. But nicotinamide is also a key component of the cellular cofactor NAD and NADH, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide uh, in its oxidized and reduced forms. And humans can acquire nicotinamide in one of three ways, either through the diet or through salvage pathways recycling and shuttling NAD and NADH and uh, NADP and NADPH enzymes, or through de novo synthesis. And de novo synthesis interests us because it's catalyzed by the enzyme called IDO, indolamine 2,3-dioxygenase. And IDO is an enzyme that is expressed in macrophages, uh, in particular in alternatively activated macrophages. And IDO is an enzyme that has also been associated with immune tolerance and plays a role in immune tolerance at the placenta in particular. 
uh, as an, uh, a brief introduction to where I'm going uh, in terms of the macrophages, what we know is that there are divergent pathways of macrophage activation. Macrophages can be either activated in what's termed a classical way, as our textbooks describe them, where they are pro-inflammatory and they release pro-inflammatory mediators, or in an alternate way, what's sometimes termed an M2 way, uh, where they release more anti-inflammatory cytokines and have been described as being involved in wound healing and in tissue repair. Um, so, you know, people can split hairs on the terminology of these different macrophages, but the principle is, is that uh, macrophages are not um, uh, universally the same. They can be activated in one of two different ways, classically activated or M1 uh, type of activation, or alternatively activated or M2 type of activation. Uh, in the M1 state, they make pro-inflammatory cytokines like TNF-alpha and IL-1. In the anti-inflammatory state, they make things like IL-10. And a very key difference uh, in, in, the, um, in the enzymes at which they express is activity of this enzyme IDO, because IDO is expressed in the alternatively activated macrophages uh, rather than in the classically activated macrophages. And what IDO does is it converts tryptophan into kynurenine um, along the pathway of nicotinamide synthesis. Now, additionally, we know that there are divergent pathways of macrophage metabolism. There is the traditional textbook kind of metabolism known as oxidative phosphorylation, uh, in which case, you know, this is the, the typical biochemistry we were taught uh, at university, that uh, cells undergo three types of, um, uh, three phases in their sugar metabolism, glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. But there is a divergent way that macrophages can be activated which is termed Warburg-like metabolism or aerobic glycolysis. And in aerobic glycolysis, um, the cell seems to stop at the glycolysis step and doesn't finish up the later stages of the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. So it's almost um, similar to anaerobic respiration where you know, if you ran a marathon and you ran out of oxygen, you wouldn't be able to complete that last step of the electron transport chain. Um, so your, your cells uh, would undergo fermentation, your glucose would get fermented to lact lactate and would not be able to complete the cycle. Um, and Warburg-like metabolism mimics that, uh, except that oxygen is in plentiful supply. Um, so it's as if you've run a marathon when actually you've got plenty of oxygen, your cell just for some reason chooses not to use it. So as a simplistic picture of this type of, of, of these two types of metabolism, here is the traditional um, textbook view of metabolism, where the cell undergoes glycolysis, um, the Krebs cycle in the mitochondrion, and then the electron transport chain happening on the membrane of the mitochondrion with oxygen as the final acceptor of the electrons. And what's going on in Warburg metabolism is that there is still glycolysis, uh, but the, the Krebs cycle may or may not still be present. There may be modifications, but the electron transport chain doesn't happen for, for, un for still unknown reasons. Now, um, this field of immunometabolism has tried to tie these two features together and say, do the divergent pathways of macrophage activation talk to the divergent pathways of macrophage metabolism? And indeed, they do. So what has become apparent is that when macrophages are infected uh, with various pathogens, uh, macrophages shift their metabolism to a Warburg-like metabolism. And the exact features and exact enzymes may differ between different pathogens, but in general, there is a shift away from the traditional oxidative phosphorylation to this Warburg-like state. Here's my schematic of this situation. So in the classically activated macrophage, um, only glycolysis is happening. This is a Warburg-like metabolism, whereas in the alternatively activated macrophage, all three steps are happening, glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain oxidative phosphorylation uh, inside the mitochondrion. Now, aging research and immunometabolism seem to be converging, and the meeting point is the central cellular cofactor nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, or NAD. Uh, so we know that NAD is central in many forms of cellular metabolism. So I'm putting NAD and NADH in the picture, in the center of my picture here. I'm not going to do any more intense biochemistry of how this NAD or NADH um, is intersecting with these, these cycles. I will leave that to my more esteemed biochemical uh, colleagues, but 
needless to say, um, this shuttling of NAD between its oxidized and reduced forms is a central and critical component of these, both of these two types of metabolism. We, as described, there are different ways that we can um, boost our NAD and NADH pools, either through shuttling between um, the existing NAD and NADH uh, stocks in the cell, or through taking in dietary nicotinamide in the form of vitamin B3. And if those are both insufficient, um, we can create our own nicotinamide through the de novo synthesis pathway via tryptophan. Now what aging research is, um, is showing us is that one of the hallmarks of aging is a reduction of intracellular NAD and a reduced NAD to NADH ratio. And indeed, all those um, risk factors that we spoke about for COVID, shown in the bottom here in this uh, blue, um, um, uh, this blue, uh, what is it? I don't know. Uh, uh, it's not a circle, but you know what I mean. All these metabolic diseases, such as obesity, diabetes, dyslipidemia, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, all of those um, usual suspects in the metabolic syndrome are all associated with disruptions in the NAD cycle. Um, and here you can see the nutritional elements can feed the NAD cycle, and then various enzymes can degrade NAD, including surgeons and PARPs. And really this NAD pathway um, is, is at the forefront of research in many different fields. So where is this taking us? This leads us to the hypothesis that infectious pathogens, including SARS-CoV-2, may cause disease by interference with host NAD pathways, and that it's pre-existing aberrations in host NAD metabolism due to diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, or aging that may worsen disease severity. Is there supporting evidence? Well, what we know is that we know that a lot of viral infections interact with the IDO pathway. Um, many viral illnesses cause an increased kynurinine to tryptophan ratio, in other words, a product to substrate ratio, for example, CMV, herpes virus, uh, one and two, hepatitis B and C, and HIV. Uh, we know that in animal influenza studies, uh, there is elevated IDO activity during animal flu. And in human influenza also, there's evidence that increased IDO activity um, occurs during human flu and is also associated with poor clinical outcome. So in this uh, human trial, uh, increased IDO activity was associated with death or transfer to intensive care or uh, requiring me mechanical ventilation. In other words, the product to substrate ratio, the kind trip ratio correlated with clinical features of severity. Also in sepsis literature, IDO activa activity is elevated, um, both in sepsis and in SERS, so the inflammatory response syndrome. And again, higher values predict mortality. And patients with sepsis um, are, are, are known to have increased chyne and decreased uh, tryptophan in their plasma as a reflection of whole body chynurinine and whole body tryptophan. Um, the chyne trip ratios correlate with severity. And it's also intriguing that chynurinine has blood vessel relaxing properties, um, which means that the activity of this enzyme IDO links together immune dysregulation with microvascular reactivity, which is an important feature of sepsis. Does, does this uh, elevated IDO activity have anything to do with NAD? Well, certainly there are in vitro studies that suggest, uh, that suggest it does. Um, in vitro, uh, NAD synthesis is required, de novo NAD synthesis is required to maintain an anti-inflammatory homeostatic state in macrophages, um, whereas in activated macrophages, NAD can become limited. Now, do we know how this relates to SARS-CoV-2? Of course, there's not much evidence out there yet. Um, but uh, there, there is a paper on the preprint server uh, that shows that SARS-CoV-2 does upregulate PARP enzymes that degrade NAD, and that SARS-CoV-2 downregulates um, the de novo synthesis of NAD from tryptophan. Now, what some of you may be thinking is, uh, this is all very nice, and these are great correlations, but how do we know that these bioenergetic shifts are really important to the pathogenesis of disease, or are they just associations um, of various inflammatory things going on in the body. So do we know that these bioenergetic shifts are associations or causations of disease? Um, so to answer this question, I'm gonna take you on a little uh, evolutionary de detour to explain to you why I think they are causative rather than merely associated with disease. 
And I'm going to take you back to the, the right to the beginning, which is the origin of mitochondria themselves, and remind you that mitochondria originated, in fact, through endosymbiosis of one prokaryotic organism within another prokaryotic organism. So it was an alpha proteobacterium that got invaginated into an archaean, and they formed a, a, a great partnership that has lasted until this day and forms the basis of all eukaryotic life as we know it, right? all plants, animals, fungi, etc. Um, simply because these two unicellular organisms got into such a fantastic partnership in this one chance event. And that really uh, raises an interesting light in which to view Warburg metabolism. Because in Warburg metabolism, when, when you have only glycolysis happening and the rest of the mitochondrial cycle doesn't complete, you can postulate that it's almost as if that mitochondrion is um, reverting to a, a kind of a primitive state uh, where it's lost this um, partnership with its other bigger cell uh, that surrounds it. So during Warburg-like metabolism, you know, one way of, of thinking about it is that cells seem to be reverting to more primitive prokaryotic type of metabolism instead of the symbiosis between mitochondria and, and cell. Um, so mitochondrial function within the cell revolves around what the textbooks often describe as an ATP-dependent uh, symbiosis. But we need to remember is also uh, very much a hydrogen dependent symbiosis and in fact has been termed this has been termed the hydrogen hypothesis uh, and and the nad nadh symbiosis between mitochondrion and cell is probably very fundamental to evolution of, of, life, of eukaryotic life itself now my second uh, evolutionary viewpoint is a more proximate one which is around uh, reproduction mammalian reproduction and I'll just point out um, this, this uh, critical time point of when the sperm fuses with the egg and um, ask you how do we inherit our mitochondrial, how do we inherit our mitochondria in general? And as you will be able to tell me, it's common knowledge that mitochondria are passed down through the maternal line. Um, we all inherit our mitochondrial DNA from our mothers. Mothers pass it to, to children of both sexes, but paternal DNA is not passed on. Now, what are the mechanisms of that? Why are paternal uh, DNA, why is paternal DNA, mitochondrial DNA not passed on? And that ha mechanism happens at the moment of conception where the sperm mitochondria are actively degraded by the egg. So in some way, the egg mitochondria, which are these um, almost UK, uh, primitive uh, unicellular little organisms in the, in the egg, don't like to be invaded by some foreign unicellular organisms that are coming from the sperm, right, the sperm mitochondria, somehow sense that these sperm mitochondria are foreign and actively degrade them. And for me, this is where uh, a lot of the evolutionary um, 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 basis of selection comes in as to how, does, uh, how do we know what is self and what is foreign? Probably it is evolving from this very moment of conception when somehow the egg seems to recognize what is self and what is foreign, and can somehow recognize paternal mitochondria as foreign. So during sperm ovum fusion, the female ovum actively targets and destroys the male mitochondria, which is a process known as mitophagy or allophagy. But the mechanism of sensing of which are self and which are foreign remains obscure and is not well characterized. Now this leads us to the relevance of this, which is that SARS-CoV-2 replication, similarly to many other viruses, comprises a double-stranded RNA stick. And double-stranded RNA can be sensed by the cell through various mechanisms, many of which are mitochondrial in their origin. And it's plausible that sensing of cytoplasmic double-stranded RNA is a conserved mechanism that stems from this process of mitophagy at conception. So the hypothesis is, is that mitochondrial sensing of viral double-stranded RNA is what induces a, a mitochondrial metabolic shift, for example, to Warburg-like metabolism. Um, and that shift precipitates changes in the NAD metabolism in the cell and precipitates perhaps an NAD deficiency in the cell. Therefore, the secondary compensatory response would be increased IDO activity in order to compensate for insufficient nicotinamide and to make more nicotinamide for the cell. So in summary, what we know is that kynurinine biosynthesis via IDO upregulation is a signature of infection with a wide range of pathogens. And that increased bio, uh, kynurinine biosynthesis implies that diverse microbes trigger a convergent host response. 
of increased de novo nicotinamide synthesis through the IDO pathway. And it's a hypothesis that the increased rate of de novo nicotinamide synthesis is compensatory due to increased NAD utilization by the cell. If this is the correct hypothesis, what would it mean? How would we intervene? Well, there are some very easy uh, ways to intervene. If the primary pathology is competition for depleted NAD stores, the rational intervention would be to increase NAD supply. Is there an easy way to do this? Well, the leading candidate would be nicotinamide itself, which is vitamin B3, uh, and that sounds straightforward enough. Um, is there any supporting evidence that this is a good idea? Well, we know that vitamin B3 in animal models can ameliorate uh, polymicrobial sepsis. And we know that nicotinamide has been used for various lung diseases in humans, including tuberculosis, where it was used as an early therapy for TB before the modern um, TB drugs. And indeed, the modern TB drugs um, were in fact developed as nicotinamide analogs. So INH was developed as a nicotinamide analog and pyrazinamide also has downstream metabolites um, that convert nicotinamide to NAD. If um, nicotinamide in itself turns out to be unsuccessful, there are a number of nicotinamide analogs um, in development or in use. Niacin is a, a, a licensed therapy used for hypercholesterolemia with some mild side effects such as flushing. And then there are some newer hot kids on the block that are the, the, the hopes of the aging research field, uh, including nicotinamide mononucleotide which seems to work better in animal models to prevent aging and the syndromes associated with aging um, than nicotinamide itself. So the, uh, in terms of human trials, there is safety data in humans, uh, but it hasn't yet, um, you know, it's, it's still in sort of early experimental stages in humans, um, similarly to the third agent on the slide, which is nicotinamide riboside. But the aging gurus focus their attention on um, those two compounds, nicotinamide mononucleotide and nicotinamide riboside, which seem to have some improvement over nicotinamide itself um, to, to ameliorate the metabolic syndrome type of uh, complications, particularly in animal models. So in conclusion, our understanding of the pathogenesis of infectious illness should shift away from a microbe-oriented view, such that the microbe is seen as causing the illness, towards a host NAD metabolism oriented view, where the microbe is seen as triggering an evolutionarily conserved response that shifts NAD metabolism. In certain contexts, such as during reproduction, shifts in NAD metabolism may be beneficial for the organism. However, in the context of disease, sh such shifts are associated with adverse consequences. Uh, I would recommend that nicotinamide should be investigated as therapy for COVID-19 and other causes of viral sepsis. And in order to actually accumulate data as to its efficacy, this needs to be done as a single agent rather than as a multivitamin cocktail. And it needs to be um, done at various doses and doses in, in um, trials for various different conditions, including cancers and various other conditions, um, such as improving neutrophil oxidative thirst and so on, have really been wide ranging. Um, the average daily recommended dose of nicotinamide, if you take it as a, just a, a nutraceutical, is around 15 milligram per day. Um, but the trials um, for these other, these other conditions go up to around one gram or three grams or even higher per day. So the dose really needs to be investigated and um, thought about and optimized. Um, and I'm certainly not advocating that we all go out and take nicotinamide, you know, just, or just uh, sort of willy-nilly, but I really do think that we should accumulate real efficacy data as to whether nicotinamide does or does not work to treat COVID-19. Um, and if the data shows that it does not work, then the related compounds, including INH, niacin, which are already licensed, and then the newer products such as nicotinamide riboside and nicotinamide mononucleotide would warrant investigation. Um, and in summary, um, I think host microbial competition and interaction for limited intracellular NAD supplies are the lens through which we should view mitochondrial metabolic shifts within the cells of the immune system. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda, for a great presentation. Now we'll go to the question and answers. Um, the first question is from Elvis. Could we say affected? Uh, could we say cells affected by SARS-CoV-2 would rely on aerobic glycolysis than oxidative phosphorylation? 
Yes, that, well, so that's the, the hypothesis would be that SARS-CoV-2 would um, cause cells to shift into Warburg metabolism, which may be, um, which may be the way we, we defend against many different kinds of viruses. But perhaps that, that shift uh, lasts too long or in some way is not compensated enough by then a later shift to the endogenous um, pathway of nicotinamide synthesis. So there's a biophasic response, right? There must be a, a, a shift, for example, pro-inflammatory followed by anti-inflammatory in terms of how we respond to innocuous viruses. Um, you know, each shift would be counterbalanced by the other shift to end up back at neutral. Um, and the hypothesis would be that in SARS-CoV-2, for some reason, we are not man managing to balance that, um, that the shift between the two states. And either that's because of something the virus is doing directly to one of the enzymes in the pathway, or it's perhaps due to certain individuals having a deficiency, um, you know, a bigger deficiency of um, nicotinamide or of tryptophan than other individuals. Um, but, but for some reason, this balance is not coming back to neutral. Okay. Um, another question is type two diseases, endemic areas or countries will have populations with high alternative activated macrophages. What is the prevalence of COVID-19 uh, in these areas? So I'm not sure I caught the beginning of that, say, of that question. So is that about um, countries that are endemic for helmets and that kind of, um, in that kind of context? Possibly, because it says type two diseases. I, I wasn't sure if it was like type two diabetes, maybe, you meant to say. Yeah. Um, so I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure we know. Um, the, I, I think this is a very dynamic, you know, the, cell, the shift in cellular metabolism would be quite dynamic and would happen quite fast and are probably, happen, probably happening kind of every day. Uh, they're, they're, they're a normal feature of cell biology. In fact, those shifts don't only happen in macrophages, but happen in T cells and in B cells and even in endothelial cells. There is the switching between um, the Warburg like and the and then the oxidative phosphorylation again. So I'm not sure there would be a systematic difference in sort of geographical regions in terms of macrophage types. I, I wouldn't think so. Okay. But, uh, that's, that's one interesting point um, just to, 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 to point, bring up there is that one of the other key enzymes uh, activated in alternatively activated macrophages is um, vitamin D, the one alpha hydroxylase. So uh, vitamin D has been quite topical around COVID and it is perhaps noteworthy just to, to point out that um, vitamin D hydroxylation, the one alpha hydroxylation step is also a key feature of alternatively activated macrophages and therefore vitamin D metabolism might tie into the picture from that, from that perspective. Okay. Another one is from Karine. Please comment on diets high in carbs with reference to the comorbidity with COVID-19? I don't know. Um, I don't know, but I'd love to see. But certainly in the animal studies, you know, that's how they do them with the mice. They feed them the high, the high you know, different feeds with carbs, high carbs or high fat in order to induce these different models. And, and that's where you'd have to ask these questions. And I'm certainly not an expert in that area, but what I do believe is that the, once you've induced these models of, of metabolic syndrome in the mice with whichever model you use, then those nicotinamide analogs seem to prolong what they call health span in mice. So even if it doesn't prolong lifespan in terms of number of months lived, you get mice that live healthily and happily into their old age um, without developing uh, you know, obesity and diabetes and all the sort of um, syndromes that, that accompany um, the mice that are untreated. Um, Sipo, um, would it be possible to think that the shift towards warbuck metabolism is driven by hypoxia during COVID since there won't be oxygen to receive the electrons at the last stage of the electron transfer? So I think that is a hypothesis that you, you, you could um, ask and you could investigate, but I suspect it's the other way around. I suspect it's the fact that you don't have um, the, the oxygen, you know, that you, you are not doing oxidative phosphorylation that leads you to be hypoxic. And the last one is, do patients taking isoniazid and, and um, other um, TB prophylactics uh, do better in terms of their severity of COVID-19 disease? 
I don't know, and it's something that we really need to answer in this country. I'm on the lookout for that data, and I urge those who are in the clinics and you know on this webinar and in clinical practice to please try and answer that question um, with practical data. But certainly, um, you know, TB didn't have the most dire consequences that we were all fearing, um, you know, before we knew how COVID would go in South Africa. They, they, it does um, increase uh, the mortality risk, but it seems to be a mild increase in mortality risk. And perhaps that's because of the treatment, uh, but I'm hypothesizing and I don't have the data. Okay, thank you very much, Melinda. So I think we've come to the end of this webinar. On behalf of the speakers, the South African um, Immunology Society, Immunopedia, and our sponsor, Indaba Biotech, thank you for joining us and taking the time to attend today's webinar. We encourage you to become a member of SAIS if you are not yet registered. The next webinar will be on the 29th of September and the theme will be on immunothrombosis. And our presenters will be Dr. Susan Lau from WITS and Professor Jessica Opie from um, University of Cape Town. Today was a very good uh, webinar. We've had over 160 attendees. So therefore, thank you all once more for attending and have a good evening. <laughs>